Okay, welcome back. Now, in this chapter, we're going to look at the ability to import an entire track from another project. And I've set up a demonstration uh, project here with a handful of tracks just to show how the import dialog works. You don't have to have any tracks set up at all. You can start from a completely blank project and import everything if you want to. And this import feature is cool. Nuendo's had it for a couple of versions, and there are some uh, obviously some creative things you can use this for, but there are also some corrective things, some problems you can solve with this uh, tool set as well. So it's a good add for Cubase. So what we're going to do is go to the File Import menu and drop down the new Tracks from Project option. Then we're going to pick the project from which we want to extract the tracks in question. And we'll pick on one of the Alan Morgan uh, demo projects. And that's going to open this import options dialog. Basically, we have selection tools on the right and then import tools. I'm sorry, the left import tools on the right. Um, now, up at the top uh, under the tracks title, you have the ability to select and deselect all, um, expand and collapse folders, and then select matching tracks and reset your search parameters. The search engine in a project this small isn't necessary, but if you have a source project that stretches to the dozens or hundreds of tracks, this can be very handy. If I want to isolate, for example, just on the guitar tracks, I can simply type in GTR, bass, etc. You get the idea. And then you'll, you'll limit your filter results, your results to that filter criteria. So on the source track side of the page, obviously, is where we're going to pick out what we want to bring in. And in this case, I want to grab the um, the drums, because I don't play drums, and I'll grab one of the guitar tracks as well, the rhythm guitar track. Once I have my source selected, the next step is where to put that information, and by default, it'll create a brand new track uh, when it comes in. But in the case of the drums, I actually have two choices. I can make a new track, or uh, I can dump it into the one existing instrument track. You'll notice what I don't have here are any of the audio tracks, for obvious reasons. And similarly, if I go down to my uh, Rhythm Guitar 2, I have options there, again, to create a new track. Or I can drop it into the would-be guitars or any one of the pre-existing audio tracks. So the system is smart enough to know what you're bringing in and what sort of existing tracks it might uh, be compatible with. So we'll drop the guitars into would-be guitars, and we'll drop the Pop Kit 1 into the I Wish I Played Drums. And I want to point out something here. If you look, you can see how the tracks are colorized in the, in the source project. They're both gray. And notice that our, all of our tracks here are nicely colorized with the new feature we'll be talking about in the last chapter. Uh, but just take note of that because it's going to bring in everything uh, with the new track. It'll bring in the track picture. It'll match the colorization, the title, obviously. And then uh, on that same subject, the first, des the first stop here on the right-hand side is track data to be imported. Obviously, we want the events and the parts. Um, we'll take the channel and settings, and channel and inspector settings. That's where the colorization is going to come from. And then if there's any automation, you have the ability to either bring it or drop it. Then let's look at the project settings. This is going to compare the two at a high level. And we have a problem here. We have an issue here. Our source project was sampled at 44.1, and our active project has been set up for 48. Now, this is exactly the situation we talked about in the chapter on uh, video import-export, that most of the music world exists at 44.1. Most of, if not all, of the film and video world exists at 48. So if you have a situation where there's a mismatch, you're going to need to use this, or probably want to use, the convert sample rate, unless you're trying to create a Chipmunks album. Uh, and this will automatically resample the audio as it comes over. So that's handy in this case, but here's a situation if uh, you had begun a composition project for a film, and partway through that you've got a good start, and then on day three suddenly you get the email that says, no, 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 this all has to be done at 48 kilohertz. How do you convert that? There's a there's hundred different ways you could. There's sample conversion algorithms within Cubase, you could use WaveLab, or you could create a fresh project at 48 and then just simply import the tracks from your other one and do the conversion right here as you import them. It's a very quick, easy way to get that conversion task done if you need it. And then the last thing to look at here is uh, where do you want the events and parts put 
And I'm going to select the default of absolute position because that's going to put them in this project the same way they were in the source. Uh, if we put them all at the cursor, like the drums start at the beginning, but the guitars don't come in until later, that would cause the guitars to get slid up to the cursor, which we don't want in this case. Um, and then the default option here is to copy uh, everything to the active project folder, which is probably the best choice in all but a few situations because that way you know all of the audio files are going to come over and now live natively in your, in your current project folder. If you don't do this, you risk the chance of coming up with missing samples or missing files. About the only time that you would want to skip this, I suppose, is if you're working in a server environment where all of your media stays on like a central drive um, and you've got separate workstations uh, and you know for sure that stuff's going to stay there, then you could just reference it. But the moment that that referencing fails, you start to end up with the, all the alarms for missing data and can't find this, can't find that. It's probably worth a little larger project file size to just copy everything over if you have the chance. choice. So that's it. With all of this done, I'm going to hit OK. And something that I want to point out, when the drums come over, um, it's going to put all the data into the, the track at the top, but watch the mixer because in the uh, source project, they had a VCA set up with each drum broken out on its own track to make mixing it and processing it easier. It's smart enough to bring all that over too. You won't see that show up in the track list, but you'll see it in the mixer channels. So here we go. And you can see the data dropped in up above just as it was in the demo project. And now down below our uh, drum world has been expanded to include uh, all of the VCA, the, the VCA and all of the individual drum channels. So that's handy. The, the group linking, all of that came over. Okay, so with all of that done, now we can take, I'm um, gonna actually mute our guitars. We can go back and there we go. We've got our drums working. And uh, now we can start to compose on top of that. And we're going to use that exercise in the next chapter to talk about the retrospective MIDI record features. So we'll be right back with that.